A very warm welcome. We are pleased you can join us on this side event to the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26. My name is Neda Salmanpour. I am the founder and chief executive officer of Global Peace and Prosperity Forum, the organization hosting this event aimed at facilitating reflection on the climate crisis facing humanity and finding solutions for a new path for human well-being and planetary sustainability. The gravity and urgency of the planetary climate emergency is patently clear, widely understood and increasingly acknowledged. Science has shown us that unless we rapidly and radically shift course, the world is heading for catastrophic climate change and possible ecolo ecological collapse. Our present predicament is a survival crisis for humanity and certainly for human civilization and for populations as we currently know them depending on the course of action we collectively choose. Yet, despite the sharpening scientific understanding, the vast majority of the world's emitters are not yet on track to meet their pledges of emission cuts within the time frame required to keep global warming limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Current global governance approaches remain weak, lacking in accountability mechanisms, fragmented and siloed. As a Secretary General of expressed in his Our Common Agenda report to the General Assembly, our understanding of we the peoples and the Charter of the United Nations needs to be expanded to protect the interests of all the people of the 21st century and to bequeath a livable world to those who follow. To meet the demands of science and the goals of the Paris Agreement, substantial commitment is required by all stakeholders to bolster efforts to deliver on concrete policies and actions aligned with a net zero future, including no coal after 2021, shifting fossil fuel subsidies to renewable energy, and setting a carbon price, a credible solidarity package of support to developing countries and vulnerable communities, as well as a new model for what growth and prosperity means for a thriving humanity. If we are to make a breakthrough to a greener, safer and better future, then we must adopt models that create a just, peaceful and ecologically sustainable world for all. I am honored and delighted that we are joined by a high level and distinguished panel who will share their valuable insights on this important topic. Sadly, Her Excellency UN Ambassador Ms. King is unable to join us today due to a last minute emergency meeting. But however, we're delighted that all of our panelists will be with us today. Our first panelist we will, um, I'd like to introduce her, is Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinoza Gasset. She is the president of the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly and former foreign minister of Ecuador. Maria, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today. You have the floor. Well, uh, Neda, it's, it's such a privilege to be here with you. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation uh, to take part of this conversation that is so timely since uh, negotiations on climate are, are um, uh, just happening uh, as we speak. And, uh, and, and thank you for a very broad, uh, comprehensive introduction, uh, Neda. Uh, greetings to all the panelists. Uh, you, I, I always say that climate change is not the problem, by, but a symptom. Uh, a symptom uh, what, of what I call a systemic crisis. Uh, and a systemic crisis uh, of a, uh, I would say, a fractured uh, relationship between the economy, society, nature and politics. And the question we are addressing today is, is not only a, a technical issue, it's not an arithmetic issue, but it is a matter of great geopolitical importance. Um, the, the climate crisis uh, it's, is an issue of justice, is an issue of human rights, and it is an issue of power and uh, of the right uh, to development uh, of countries uh, of the global south. So, um, and, and we are living a paradox, uh, uh, Neda and dear friends. On one hand, uh, the science is clear. The only way to save not only the planet, but uh, the human species 
is by cutting in half emissions by 2030 and reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. You, you said it so clearly. And um, it so happens that uh, more than 70% of emissions come from the energy sector. And uh, however, you know, efforts to, to stabilize uh, our climate uh, are not fully considering the development needs of, of the global south. And I'm not saying that we can really not take seriously the need for a proper uh, energy and ecological transition in our economies, but the gl global south uh, uh, countries uh, need uh, affordable energy sources uh, that are essential uh, for production, transportation, and also for the fight against poverty uh, in uh, their relative country. So uh, objectives, fossil projects, and fuels, and the only way to addressing the climate crisis. But at the same time, they will have, and we know, profound social, political, and economic impacts in developing countries. So let, let's consider for a minute that in northern industrialized wealthy countries, they are facing, you know, a great difficulties uh, regarding swift and effective uh, ecological transition. Uh, transi let's only only imagine how oil dependent uh, developing countries such as uh, Angola, Congo, South Sudan, Timor Leste, my own country, Ecuador, Guyana, etc., will end oil production uh, in a matter of 10 or 20 years. Uh, when the, the income uh, comes, uh, be, uh, the income corresponds to about 60, 70% of all their fiscal revenues. And we witnessed a few days ago, uh, last week, the G20 um, saying in a way, yes, but not quite ready for the 2030, 2050 target. And we witnessed that. So the language in the G20 document is a little bit watered down. So I think that in spite of of the good intention, pledges, vision for adaptation, for resilience building, I think that we need a reality check, quite honestly. And I think that um, basically we, we have uh, sometimes we, we tend to forget the very principle of the Convention on Climate Change uh, that uh, says that, uh, you know, we, we have to go by the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. So uh, objectives such as um, facing off coal production, stopping fossil fuels, any fossil fuel subsidies, et cetera, et cetera, are, are critical, but uh, you know, are also difficult to, to, to achieve. And uh, when you look at the data, the, the, the IMF, International Monetary Fund um, um, re study, I think in, in 2020, um, basically is, is saying that uh, oil uh, fossil fuel subsidies uh, amount for uh, fine, almost six trillion dollars only in 2020. And that represents uh, almost 70% of uh, world GDP. So basically uh, this is um, this is also a uh, uh, a reality that cannot be changed by a decision uh, so quickly because removing subsidies to fossil fuels, especially in the in global South countries, uh, you know, it, it has and can have a tremendous social impact, social unrest. My own countries, people went to the streets uh, to complain about the increase in in uh, in uh, in the in the prices of uh, of, of of gas and in in oil. We know, and I, I was saying about the paradox. We know that it's urgent, that these measures are urgent for mitigating climate change. For uh, no, we, we need the investment in fossil fuels, uh, but at the same time, we have to compare the, the differences in fiscal realities in countries like Norway or, or Ecuador, Norway or, or, or the Netherlands and, and Guyana, for example. And 
you know, basically, let's think for a moment, uh, who is going to pay for the price increase in public transport, for example, who uses public transport to start with, and uh, what is going to happen with um, the production costs in industry, which countries and companies have the capacity of going through a profound industrial reconversion. And um, so the, uh, the um, climate finance really has to address these, uh, these issues. Um, climate finance uh, have to be uh, teamed up with capacity building, with technology transfer. Uh, it, you know, basically what we have seen is that uh, for uh, a, a renewable, new renewable uh, carbon neutral energy matrices and, and proper transitions, we are seeing that um, governments uh, are, are not getting the concessional funding that, that they need. So I, I think that basically uh, we, we say that it is time and because of all these um, discussion about a, a new and uh, uh, the possibility of building forward better. Uh, we also have the, repo the, the possibility uh, of uh, recovering in a way that is carbon neutral, that is more equal, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we are seeing that the, the reality is very, very different because, uh, you know, if you look at the, you tell me when my time is up, because I can continue. <laughs> We're getting there. Go ahead. Just... Okay, you let me know. But <laughs> I was I was saying, let's look at the at the recent UNEP emissions gap report. Uh, basically, what they're saying is that I think it's sixteen point seven trillion uh, that uh, the the developed world has invested uh, to recover the economies uh, because of COVID. Uh, in, in these studies, uh, May 2021, basically, uh, only, you know, 16.7 trillion. Now I can confirm only 438 billion you know, was invested in uh, reducing um, emissions. So it's really very, very, very little uh, that, and, and we need uh, much more. So basically, um, when we look now, uh, 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 an agreement on methane is also in the making in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, methane emissions are the second largest contributor to global warming. We know that. They contribute, I think, uh, around 30% uh, to the net warming impact of, of, of green, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, but what is the problem? Uh, the, the origins of methane, it's agriculture, basically 40%, 35% um, fossil fuels. And, uh, in, in basically, uh, the arithmetic of that is most uh, um, countries in the global south are strong and prominent in global methane emissions. So yet again, the geography of, of, of climate change is, is very complicated, very, very complicated. So uh, I, I think uh, just to make uh, the story short, um, the, the evidence shows that we are in the verge of an ecological and civilizational collapse. This is true, the extinction crisis, the pollution crisis, the climate crisis. Uh, and um, at the same time, believe me, in my almost two decades of climate negotiations, I don't think I have ever seen so many newspaper articles, so many op-eds, so many scientific analyses, hashtags for it's, uh, it's now or never, don't choose extinction, code red for humanity, you know, everything. Uh, but it is the first time uh, in almost two years that the, the climate editorials and headlines exceed those from COVID-19. So this is telling us that the world is worried, is concerned. We're seeing thousands of people in the street demonstrating in Glasgow. So something is changing, something is, uh, is moving, plus the science, the last IPCC report, etc. So the truth is, I believe that it is now or never. 
we have to see, and we will check later with, uh, with uh, uh, Giovanna to say what is happening in, in Glasgow. Is Glasgow going to deliver? Is Glasgow going to be uh, you know, at the level of, of the world's expectations? Everybody is, is really uh, looking at what is going to happen uh, there. Um, and there are two or three critical issues that need to happen. The number one is to close and finalize the, 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 the Paris rule book, meaning the operational framework to make the Paris Agreement a reality. So this rule book has been in the making for the last five years, and I think it is time that we come up with, with, uh, with something, uh, an agreement on, the, on comparable national determined uh, contributions. What, what is that we compare in terms of the year of start, uh, how much, what are the indicators to compare uh, the quality and, and really the impact of, of, uh, of national efforts. And, and number three, the, the finance package. And the finance package making sure that uh, the needed amounts are invested in mitigate in adaptation and resilience building and not only in mitigation. So there are uh, many things that the world expects. I really hope that Glasgow is going to be, to be more a, a, a breakthrough than a breakdown. And uh, we have to see how uh, things unravel. And perhaps in a second round, if there is chance, I would yes. love to, to talk about the connection between inequalities yes. and climate, uh, the role of women, indigenous peoples, uh, in uh, addressing uh, and taking thank you so much Maria on thank our you. climate future and on back to you thank you so much Maria fantastic start fantastic comprehensive um, overview for for all our uh, participants I'm sure they're enjoying your conversation as much as I am i uh, finishing off with the finance package I mean it leads us to our next speaker we have with us uh, Dr. Augusto Lopez Claros he is an international economist with 30 years of um, experience. Um, Augusto um, is now a global um, chairman of, uh, he's the chairman of the Global um, Governance Forum, and he was uh, the former director of Global Indicators Analysis at the World Bank. Thank you very much, Augusto, for joining us today, and um, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Um, thank you, Neda. And thank you to Ms. Espinosa for her, for her initial remarks, which actually uh, are a very, a very good way to get me started on the subject that I want to discuss, which is uh, an issue that you already raised, namely the question of how we are going to finance the transition to a renewable energy economy. Um, you know, coming out of Paris in 2015, um, there was a sense that uh, we needed to invest heavily in um, you know, energy efficiency and renewable energy and uh, sort of low carbon resilient infrastructures. And very quickly, the experts tried to get, got us, get a sense of what was the scale of this investment. And they chose a kind of cumulative figure by 2030. And the numbers are really huge. Um, it is estimated that we would need to spend somewhere between 75 and $90 trillion between 2015 and 2030. Essentially, you know, to, to adapt uh, to climate change, uh, to do the kinds of transformations that are necessary to basically revamp and transform our economy, but also to preserve the development gains that we had seen over the previous uh, 30 years. Uh, Ms. Espinosa already alluded to this aspect of the problem. You know, since 1990, when the World Bank began to collect data, we have made fairly steady progress in reducing the incidence of extreme poverty, except that in 2020, because of COVID, uh, we had a huge setback. And we have seen an increase of maybe up to 100 million people falling below the extreme poverty line. And so because there is this sense that climate change is going to hit the developing world, especially harshly, uh, partly because they, they're heavily dependent on agriculture, there is this sense you know, that we need to come to the, to the support of especially the developing world and that this huge package of financing um, needs to include an element 
that will try to preserve the development gains achieved since, since 1990. Now, obviously, having set this huge, uh, huge uh, number, uh, immediately the issue is, you know, how challenging is this going to be? And uh, uh, this is where I bring my perspective as an economist. I think that the issue of raising this kind of funding over a 15 year period, and we only have nine years left, by the way, is going to be a huge challenge. Partly because we're still living under the, the, the effects of the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, which led to a huge increase in, in public debt levels, which reduces the fiscal space that countries have. And of course, in 2020, we had this calamity called COVID-19, which has worsened the fiscal outlook for most of the countries in the world. According to the IMF, the increase in public debt levels on average in 2020 were on the order of 20 percentage points of GDP. We haven't seen anything like this in the last 100 years. Um, so this is, this is a, it, it sort of, not only is it a huge fiscal deterioration, but it also highlights the complexities and the difficulties of rating this kind of, this kind of uh, funding over the next uh, you know, decade or so. So one question is basically, how are we going to do it? What are the potential sources of funding you know, to finance this transition? And uh, I have many to share with you and, and I will look at my watch and I will focus perhaps initially on, on two of the most important ones. And then later during the discussion, I can come back and, and highlight some of the other ones because it's going to involve a kind of a multifaceted approach. But the first one that I want to discuss is, is the whole question of carbon taxes. Um, Ms. Espinosa already alluded to this in, in her remarks. And um, the IMF says that of all the mitigation strategies that we have before us to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, carbon taxes are the most powerful and the most efficient. Those are words that they have used in, in a report that they wrote recently. However, the starting point is very dire, is, is very, uh, what, how, what, how can I say, you know, uh, it's very complicated. Just to give you an example, they say that, the IMF says that, we have to move on average carbon taxes from the $2 per ton of CO2 emissions, which is the current level on average across the world, to something like $75 per ton by 2030 to keep within a two degree centigrade, not even one and a half degrees, right? Which is the accepted norm, but let's say two degrees centigrade, you know, which relaxes the, 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 the standard a little bit, right? The problem is that at the moment, we only have two countries in the world that have taxes that are already in excess of 75. That's Switzerland and Sweden. Uh, Sweden, Switzerland, I think, has $96 per ton, and Sweden has $127 per ton. Um, countries like Japan, Mexico, they're, you know, $2, two dollars, two and a half dollars, and so on. Now, why is why are carbon taxes, you know, the most powerful and efficient instrument? Basically, because they act on multiple fronts. They obviously, in the first instance, make it costlier to emit uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, they provide incentives for energy users to shift to greener, greener sources. Um, they make it uh, possible for us to reduce the, reduce the intensity of power generation, uh, to move to renewables, and to, you know, to the use of more efficient appliances, to electric cars, and so on. In other words, having established a, a carbon tax, then you create an environment in which all of these in innovations are possible and in which the incentives shift in a way that makes the transition to renewable energy much, much easier. There is a second benefit beyond this issue of incentives, which has to do with revenue collection. If you impose a carbon tax or raise carbon taxes gradually over time, this leads to substantial revenue collection. The IMF estimates something like 1.6% 1, 1. of GDP per year uh, for the G20 countries. Right? This is like one to one and a half trillion dollars per year. So we are already talking about you know, substantial revenue. And this revenue can be redeployed you know, for useful ends, you know, including something that Ms. Espinosa alluded to, which is basically cushioning the impact on low-income groups. Uh, 
if we're going to save a phase out subsidies uh, to energy, that means uh, gasoline, um, carbon, electricity, natural gas, we have to do this in a way that is smart. Um, what do I mean by this? That it has, to be, it, it has to be done in a way that is sustainable, that can actually be implemented. We don't want to repeat the experience of the French in 2018 when they introduced a carbon tax, which had the predictable impact of increasing the price of transport which then led to young people in, in some of the Paris suburbs and other cities in France coming out onto the streets. You remember the yellow jackets, right? Mm -hmm. What was the outcome of that measure? Essentially, the, the measure was withdrawn. It was a complete calamity. The government, you know, it had huge political costs for the government. And in the end, they did not do what they wanted to do, which was to, uh, to introduce a, a, you know, a higher carbon tax. So, Managing the political economy of this is very, very important. It has to be done gradually. It has to be done in a way that shows to the, to the, to the population the benefits of, of the tax in terms of reduced emissions. It certainly helps if the government is not corrupt because when you have corrupt governments, uh, people resent uh, increases in taxes because they assume that the money is going to leak away and it's not going to be used in, in, in uh, you know, constructive ways. So, this is a kind of a complicated, complicated um, issue, but it, it has to be done. And one of the disappointments of COP26 well, COP so far is that, you know, the countries are not moving in this direction. They are all waving their hands at it. They are finding substitute uh, measures, uh, you know, trying to go through the, regula the regulations, uh, regulatory side. Um, you know, which is fine. Regulation has to be an important component of this of, of this strategy. Yes, you need to make incent to provide incentives for cars to be become electric, and, and and you know you need to address fuel efficient standards and so on and so forth. But without a carbon tax, I'm afraid that it's not going to work. And and I I, I really deeply regret that governments, um, because they don't have the patience and they don't have the skills to do the political economy in a good way, you know, they're basically waving their hands at this and, and we're not doing what is really the most important thing that we could do. Let me, let me mention a second area which has been talked about uh, in other contexts, which has to do with taxing financial transactions. And the reason I want to mention this is, is because this is a potentially very large pocket of resources at relatively low cost. Let me explain. You know, James Tobin, a very famous American economist who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1972, he gave a speech at Princeton University. It's a celebrated speech in which he said that uh, uh, speculation in the foreign exchange market was, was destabilizing as was, and was beginning to have a sort of impact on the real economy. And so he proposed the introduction of a tax on foreign exchange transactions because he said that a lot of the, a lot of the transactions that take place in, in this market are basically of a speculative nature. You know, they are not really driven by any kind of uh, sort of sound economic, economic uh, uh, need, such as, for instance, financing uh, uh, international trade. They tend to be overwhelmingly transactions where uh, something is bought in the morning and is sold in the afternoon or a day or two later. Right? And so at that time, um, um, th this, this was a, a, an interesting idea. His, his, his thinking was not to raise revenue to finance development. It was basically to, to um, uh, reduce the speculation in the, in the foreign exchange markets. By 1995, in other words, some 20 years later after his talk at Princeton, um, foreign exchange trading was something like $1.3 trillion per day, right? Which is on an annual basis is like 70 times larger than total international trade, right? So in other words, because the financial markets are large, um, a very tiny tax can actually generate a huge amount of revenue. In fact, today, because since 1995, when Tobin updated his proposal, and he said, let's broaden the definition of the tax, not just to foreign exchange transactions, but to financial transactions in general, including purchases of bonds and equities and so on. 
by, 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 but today, the volume of daily trade in these financial instruments is six and a half trillion dollars. So if you impose a 0.05% tax, right, which is very, very small, you can actually generate something like $800 billion per year of revenue, which then can be used to, to finance this transition to a renewable economy uh, for development purposes, to fight uh, um, you know, poverty and income inequality, to promote the gender equality. I mean, you know, basically to do debt reduction, for instance, for the highly indebted countries, uh, it's a way of expanding the fiscal space, which has been so narrowed in recent years because of COVID, because of the global financial crisis more than a decade ago and so on. So, so a group of a thousand economists in 2011 have signed a declaration supporting this tax. It's called the Robin Hood tax now, uh, because it's essentially, uh, the idea is to tap some resources out of the financial sector, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, huge and, and generates a great deal of, of income and, you know, rechannel those resources, you know, for, for constructive ends. Um, I will stop here, although there is an additional idea that I want to share, but I can, I can wait for the next round, which has to do with the role of the IMF and SDR allocations. It is a slightly technical subject, but here again, there is potentially a very large uh, volume of resources that could be deployed you know, to finance this transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Augusta, for a very comprehensive um, presentation on the finance side. Um, if I can now go to um, Giovanna, Giovanna Cule, or Quale, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, Giovanna, she is a, a project coordinator at Agarapa Institute, and Giovanna is also involved with Together First um, Coalition. Giovanna coordinates research and advocacy projects in the areas of global governance, uh, the United Nations, climate and security, conflict prevention, and peace operations. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your um, remarks. Giovanna, where are you? In Glasgow. I'm in Glasgow. We, we've lost um, visual from with you. Jovan is joining us live from Glasgow. So this is how live events go. Um, we can't hear you or see you at the moment, Giovanna. So I, th I think what we can do, um, just wait a bit more. If not, then we will go to Maria um, until um, Yuta join us. Yuta is also in. in... Can you hear me? Um, we've lost you completely. I think you need to rejoin. So um, let me go back to Maria. Maria, um, can you please um, share with, uh, I think Giovanna. Giovanna, yes, we, we have you back with us. That's good. Um, but you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Good to see you. Oh, you're from Glad. The world is having its last best chance to the most pressing global challenge of our time. I want to say that I'm very privileged to be here. I don't know if Glasgow will deliver as Maria, that the code book of Paris is finalized here. Uh, but in terms of the negotiations, the first draft is out. I didn't look at it yet. Uh, a lot's going on here, and I'm following mostly the civil society participation and side events. I got here three days ago. And one thing that is clear is that this, the disconnection between the public and the negotiations, uh, and we need everyone on the table. So there is, it's important to mention that there is a lot of financial barriers to connect the people, particularly from the global south, uh, which will mostly need the support for a just 
tradition. But even uh, with that, civil society is massively here, even with all the difficulties, particularly by COVID in the global south. So just to give you a taste, there are protests every day in front of the main venue. And I'm now here at the Blue Zone, where only accredited civil society can get inside. Negotiators don't even need to society, which is very different from other cops and from Madrid two years ago. And also to like to disrupt this uh, the system, there is on being together the climate just how can we make change happen? And that is happening outside um, in venue. So I think we lost Giovanna. We've lost you again. Maybe if you find an, a, a, a better spot. Um, we've lost Giovanna again. So um, let me go back to Maria. Maria, maybe we will take this opportunity to discuss the nexus between um, gender equality and, and climate change. I know that's going to be a topic uh, coming up in CSW 66, and um, perhaps you can enlighten us on, on that. Maria, you're, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Neda. And, uh... And basically, such a pity. I really hope that we can get uh, Giovanna back because yes. I'm so interested in testing the waters on on how uh, Glasgow is is going. But in in listening um, to Augusto, it is so clear that we have the technical tools in hand. That uh, basically we know what to do. You know, to to finance uh, a, a proper a low carbon uh, transition that either, you know, carbon tax or uh, the, the wealth tax or the financial transaction tax um, and uh, the money is out there uh, looking at uh, the, the, the amounts of money that goes uh, go into um, as subsidies to fossil fuels. We understand that it is, uh, there are, uh, resources, uh, but I think the problem goes beyond. This is not a technical conversation. It is not even a scientific conversation anymore. The data is important to know that we have the, the, the tools, that we have the technology, that we have the money. It's important to know that uh, we have the means. And in the basic problem here, and sorry, I'm not responding directly to your question, Neda, but uh, no. in listening to Augusto, listening a little bit to Giovanna, uh, basically what is happening is that uh, we are not negotiating uh, quotas or, uh, you know, and emissions. Uh, we are negotiating power and the right to development. We have to be very honest uh, with that. And the difficulties uh, are not that we don't know, you know, what are the uh, options that we have. Yes, we do know. Um, I think the climate finance side, it's, it's so chaotic. Uh, the, Augusto is the expert, but correct me if I'm wrong. We never know. I mean, we, we see the billions and the trillions and the pledges, uh, but we really don't know for sure what are the means. We have the Green Climate Fund. I was in the negotiation of the Green Climate Fund. It's there, it's underfunded, but it's there. Uh, you know that the Green Climate Fund, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it accounts for, I, I would say, less than 20% of the global climate finance. It's a little piece of what is going on. Uh, we have to be uh, serious about, uh, you know, private investment and the role of the private sector. 
uh, in, in uh, climate stabilization clearly, what are the funds that, that are public, what are the funds that are private, uh, in, you know, who gets what, uh, what is mitigation, what is adaptation, uh, you know, how to finance the resilience building efforts that countries are doing, especially small island developing states. We need clarity and accountability on climate finance, that's for sure. How to match the pledges with what is already being, uh, you know, um, uh, provided to countries, what are the means, what are the instruments. This is uh, something that uh, requires clarification. And, um, and again, and, and here we, we need vision, we need generosity. Uh, we need countries to understand that, uh, you know, this is not uh, a minor thing. This is an issue that is putting in risk uh, the continuity of the human species in this planet is as important as that. And basically, uh, we it's a mortgage uh, to the future generations. That's why they are in the streets right now, as we speak, saying, please, you know, be responsible. And... Um, and, and of course, the Global South is asking, but we need the resources, but we need the technology transfer, but we need the capacity building. Uh, and, and this needs to happen, but uh, beyond words, uh, you know, deeds uh, and not words uh, on, on, on climate justice. And sorry, I, I responded no, a completely different No, issue, no, no, I'm, I'm, happy, of course, uh, I'm happy you mentioned uh, climate justice and to I, just to jump in if i may on that because for me um watching um watching, watching cops um what was moving for me was the testimonies the stories uh from the frontline islands um tuvalu papua new guinea fiji antigua barbuda barbados um they were talking about they are uh, the least responsible for these climate emissions but they are the they are bearing the worst consequences and that um, the global response to the climate crisis must be fair and effective. And this raises the issue of accountability of the developed states to uh, compensate for losses and damages from their emissions for those on the front line, um, the lions of small islands and um, the least developed countries. So if responsibility um, for preventing catastrophe falls disproportionately on those who did not, who did not um, cause it, um, how are we going to have global cooperation? Can I um, first ask, um, maybe bring in Giovanna now that she's back with us um, to, to respond on that, and then maybe then go to Augusto for that. Thank you, Maria. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's try again. Let's try. So, yeah, I think it, when the connection failed, I was just finishing to talk about the feeling here and the the issues of civil society. So what I wanted to talk a bit also about um, the other crisis we are accelerating because of the climate crisis. And if we don't act now, we might take generations to reverse. So I wanna talk a bit about our common agenda, which is the Secretary General visionary report that put a number of ideas of how can we address current and future challenges advancing the 12 themes of the UN 750 declaration so our common agenda is about accelerating a new kind of multilateralism towards a sustainable future. And it was a genuine, genuine multi-stakeholder effort because it was informed by consultations with member states, thought leaders, young people, civil society, and the UN system. And my organization, the Garpa Institute, uh, led the global consultation with civil society. And this involved not only NGOs and think tanks, but also the private sector, parliamentarians, city leaders, and particularly the underrepresented groups. So many of the proposals, some already um, discussed by Maria Fernanda and Augusto, uh, they were generated uh, through these many consultations. Um, and I think we can say that's the heart with the peoples because we can find many of the proposals we've been discussing for a, quite some time as civil society there. And this report calls for many things, uh, some of them being uh, reimagined social contract, more solidarity across the generations so we can protect our climate environment and our planet for all people now and in the future, and about uh, forms to protect the global commons and public goods. So I wanted to emphasize six features of this report that I think are important for a sustainable future and this new kind of multilateralism that we need to tackle climate change. 
So uh, my points, they are based on, for protecting our commons, uh, they are based on the last edition of UNA UK magazine that you can check the code red for humanity and also the, the report accelerating global cooperation, which was the summary of the digital consultations we led. And I encourage you all to check both. I will post the links here. So first in line with what Maria Fernanda and Augusto said, we need more ambitious climate plans. And we also need evidence-based ways to measure progress. So I completely agree. And I think everyone here does that we need desperately to shift fossil fuel subsides to renewable energy and provide, you know, a package of support to developing countries. And this includes delivering the target of 100 billion every year and allocating at least 50% of climate finance for adaptation and resilience, as well as technological and capacity building. And the other proposals, such as complementary measures to the GPD that can change the way we measure progress in, in relation to human and planetary well being. And also, we need verifiable targets for the financial actors so they shift their portfolio away from the high emissions to climate resilience and a net zero economy. And we also need timelines for the implementation. So, I think all these proposals should be considered here and beyond. Uh, and we also need to change our global economic governance. Um, so biennial meetings of the G20, UN, and the international financial institutions to discuss coordination on the long-term and innovative financing. Also the sustainable development goals, investment boost. You know, we have the decade of action ahead. And we also need to resolve the long-standing weaknesses in the international debit architecture. Uh, so these are some of the transformative shifts we need to get there. And we also need international mechanisms to address crisis. For instance, uh, an emergency platform as a kind of framework that would be triggered automatically in global crisis. And this platform could bring together leaders and experts from different sectors and provide the mechanism for capacity, you know, to have focal points to exchange with existing arrangements and identify ways to make our system ready for crisis. Uh, fourth, we also need mechanisms to address the future challenges. One of the proposals in our common agenda is um, a trustship council for the global commons, which could be reproposed uh, as a multi-stakeholder body to tackle emerging challenges and act on behalf of future generations. So we have guidance on the governance of the global commons and delivery of the global public goods and the managing of global public risk. And I think finally, we also need to create momentum and to continue momentum after COP to get to the tipping point, to advance ideas for the governance arrangements that we need. And I think the proposed uh, summit of the future in 2023, and you know, in line with um, Stockholm Plus 50 and the other high level meetings we have, uh, could be a perfect occasion for that and tracks could include the management of global public goods and major risks, sustainable development and climate action beyond 2030 and future generations, as well as other proposals just such as the global digital compact. And obviously all of these tracks should be inclusive. And if we want a global system that works with stakeholders to protect the global commons for present and future generations, we need to ensure that our common agenda does not become another high-minded report on a shelf. So we must work together with other stakeholders to support member states and the Secretary General to turn recommendations into actionable plans. And it's also up to us, civil society, to hold our states and international uh, organizations to account. So I would love to continue the discussion and answer any other questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me go back to um, maybe Augusto. Um, if we can address maybe the um, another financial aspect of, of what's going on. Um, so Augusto, um, the environmental crisis is rooted in global patterns of human behavior that are ecologically unsustainable. Rampant materialism has generated gross patterns of consumption, accumulation waste, uh, creating inordinate pressures on, on the world's ecological system, as we've heard. This raises a question about how we humans change course. How can we trigger that transformational change needed for the path to net zero? 
um, in time without addressing our economic model and the value system that drives growth at all costs. Augusto. Um, thank you, Neda. That's a very, very large question. And I'd like to, I'd like to address some aspects of your question as well as comment briefly on some of the very, very nice comments made by, by Giovanna. I think that, you know, 2020 was in a sense a unique opportunity um, for us to rethink a little bit about the kind of economic governance that has that 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 we have had in place, you know, in the post-war period. Um, let me let me elaborate a little bit what what I mean by this. Um, one of the things that we noticed in 2020 was how unprepared we were for the pandemic. Correct. Um, we saw our public health systems, our hospitals uh, come under huge pressure. And I'm not talking just about the small developing countries, uh, you know, even in high income countries in Europe and North America, you know, saw um, just how um, inadequate uh, were the public health facilities and infrastructures in, in the face of a sort of a global, global pandemic. So I think that um, one important lesson to come out of, of COVID-19 is that we need to rethink seriously our spending priorities. Um, both uh, um, Maria Fernanda and, and Giovanna have alluded to, to you know, the huge amounts that we're spending subsidizing energy. You know, this is really, a, a, if you think about it, it's a, 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 an absolutely um, uh, sort of um, misplaced public policy because you know, we're accelerating climate change by stimulating consumption of fossil fuels. That's the immediate effect of the subsidies. But we're also actually in worsening income inequality because the IMF has estimated that 60% of the benefits go to the 20%, uh, uh, top 20% of the income distribution, right? In other words, it's the, the people who have cars who get the subsidies. Uh, driving their, 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 their vehicles in, in New Delhi and in other uh, cities in the, in the world. It's not the, uh, the illiterate uh, poor uh, village women in India you know, who are the beneficiaries of, this, of, of these subsidies. Right? So um, we need to rethink basically you know, how we spend our public resources. And one aspect of that obviously has to do with financing the transition to a renewable energy and doing the kinds of things which we know we need to do. Uh, I, I think that Maria Fernanda made a very vital point, which is that we're not lacking in knowledge. We have the tools, we have the instruments. Uh, the solution to the problem of climate change has already been in evidence for the better part of the last, the last 20, 30 years, right? What we lack is political will, what we lack is governments with credibility, who can take on vested interests. Um, we lack a greater sense of solidarity across the world, which will allow us to see, for instance, the problem of the small island states, which you mentioned, for whom climate change is an existential threat. I mean, some of these countries are going to disappear. They knew, we need to be thinking how we're going to redeploy those populations and where we're going to take those, those, those populations because these islands will be underwater within, within a few decades. One second aspect, if I may add, um, which again builds or, or sort of builds on, on comments made by Maria Fernanda and by Giovanna, has to do with our concept of national security. You know, when, when, when you ask a, 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 a somebody in the streets, you know, do you think that national security is a good thing? They will tell you, yes, of course, you know. Uh, politicians uh, run for office in the United States and other countries, uh, you know, uh, putting themselves on the side of national security. But this concept is typically understood in militaristic terms. When, when politicians, when prime ministers, when the media, talk about national security, it is generally understood in terms of weapon systems, the ability of the state to defend its borders from perceived or imaginary threats, uh, maintaining military establishments, you know, using the latest technologies to have extremely modern air forces and on and on and on. And of course, in the case of the nuclear powers, you know, maintaining their, their nuclear deterrence, uh, you know, ready and, and uh, you know, as, as, modern, as, as modernized as possible. 
And yet, let me point something to, which is obvious to all of us, right? In 2020, you could have thousands of nuclear weapons and they were completely useless. You could have very sophisticated, extremely fast uh, uh, military aircraft capable of wreaking destruction on your enemies and they were completely useless in the face of a pandemic, an airborne virus against which, had, which we had no immunity. So it seems to me that this raises a more fundamental question, which is that we need to think of national security in terms of human welfare. Maybe national security has to be rephrased and we have to ask questions about, you know, are we ready for the next pandemic, which will come? The scientists have already told us. See, the, 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 the virus, COVID-19, is a symptom of something else that is happening in the world, which is basically that we're invading uh, forests, where we are invading habitats that were in previous decades and centuries, uh, the places of animals uh, which carry viruses against which we have no immunity. As we expand the scale of the global economy, as we build more roads, as the population continues to grow, as we use more energy, you know, our footprint uh, is, is, is increasing and we are making ourselves more vulnerable for the kinds of, of viruses that have already been in evidence in the last 20 years. It isn't just COVID, it was MERS, it was SARS, it was Ebola, and whoever, whatever else comes, comes into the future. So, so maybe security has to be reframed, asking first and foremost, are we ready for the next pandemic? Uh, uh, do we, ha are we spending enough in the education to empower our young people to have the skills and the knowledge which is going to allow them to uh, uh, operate in an increasingly complicated, complex global economy? Um, are we building the kinds of infrastructures which are going to you know, allow us to, to make this transition to uh, renewable energy? And on and on and on. I could pose you know, 10 such questions, right? And the answer to that question, unfortunately, is no, we're not. You know, I regret to say, and this really pains me to say this, that COVID-19, unfortunately, is not going to be the once in a lifetime opportunity that comes our way for our political leaders, our business community, civil society, to raise very, very tough questions and to begin rethinking about you know, the kind of governance system that we have today. And I, I think that's one of the great regrets of this, of this crisis. Whether it will take something much larger, and Maria Fernanda has alluded already to the kinds of calamities that are coming our way linked to loss of diversity, rising sea levels, extreme weather events, and you know, all the other things that we read about on the, on the, on the, on the, on the media all day. You know, um, if we are unable to keep temperatures below one and a half degrees or two degrees, then it's possible that we're gonna have a rapidly accelerating climate change and the temperatures by the middle part of the century or perhaps sooner are going to be you know, three degrees uh, and up and so on. And maybe that will then, you know, force us to finally, uh, you know, do a fundamental rethinking of the institutions and, and to amend our global governance our architecture in a way that actually finds, helps us to find solutions to these problems. At the moment, we don't have that. Uh, Paris, Paris 2015 and the framework that has come out of that is not working. And COP26, unfortunately, is a fairly, fairly dramatic and fairly depressing, so far anyway, unless a miracle happens between now and Friday, indication that our, our, our leaders and other stakeholders, including obviously the financial sector and the business community, are not ready to take this problem on uh, and to do the kinds of things that are necessary to mitigate it, its impact and to protect um, uh, humanity from what's coming our way. Thank you. Um, so many points raised there. I mean, uh, we had um, President Obama mentioning that the, you know, this uh, huge migration of people is a national security, not just for the US, but for the world all over. And um, I was thinking, yes, um, COP26 hasn't been what it should have been, but as we're going down this route of climate crisis, um, 
down the line, maybe the environmental crisis, maybe the catalyst that will push us towards this idea of global governance. I mean, for me, when you look at the pandemic, what happened was we were able to shut our borders and everybody stayed in, but with the, with the global climate crisis, you can't do that. You can't shut borders. It's coming to you wherever you are and it's affecting us wherever we are. So what do you think? Do you think that's a possibility? Um, maybe I will turn to Maria at the moment. What do you think, Maria? Well, uh, I, I just missed last part. What, uh, what is the possibility that you were... Uh, that, that the environmental crisis down the line is yeah, going to yeah. push us towards this um, global governance that we need because we need everyone involved in it. And we had, like for um, two major powers, didn't attend um, uh, the COP26. Not everyone's involved. Finance is still ahead, you know, is the major issue that's holding everybody back. But unless you have a global... Um, architecture, global governance architecture, you can't change things on a global um, uh, theater of life. What do you think? Yes, well, absolutely. I, I think that uh, if you look at uh, our current uh, global challenges, um, it is pretty obvious that uh, they are determining factors of our future. If, if you look at uh, the climate crisis, of course, we abundantly, abundant um, evidence that climate change is not only uh, uh, hurting the most vulnerable, it's not only happening in small island developing states, it is happening in Canada, in the Arctic, 200 people died in Germany because of floods uh, this uh, um, uh, this summer, so it is touching every you know every corner of the of the planet. Uh, if you put together the climate crisis, the inequalities crisis, which has uh, widened even more because of of the COVID uh, economic and financial and social impacts, uh, if you team that up with the extinction crisis and the global health crisis. All, all these uh, multiple interconnected crises, uh, you know, cannot be addressed uh, uh, by one country alone, regardless of its uh, square kilometers GDP, uh, because these interconnected crises uh, do not respect boundaries, do not respect uh, respect national borders. So, in in and I really think that. Yeah, I, I am a poet. I know how important words and narratives are, but uh, we really need uh, to deliver. We really, really need to go from pledges to investment, uh, from commitments to action, and, and, and to make substantial changes. So sometimes I fear that, uh, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the climate crisis is a symptom of, of a dysfunctional system of a systemic crisis. Sometimes uh, I really fear that we want to go through this uh, band-aid approach uh, to a profound structural crisis. Uh, okay, so let's fix that, Let, let's do that, let's have a, a methane deal, let's, without addressing, you know, profound consumption and production patterns, without uh, addressing the finance that go beyond climate finance, uh, if you look at the trillions that have been invested for COVID recovery, especially in the global north, we're, we're speaking trillions of dollars, how much is gone through a new path of development, a new path, uh, a, a green circular economy, um, a regenerative uh, agriculture, how much has gone into that and how much continues to go to the sectors that we know are destroying our planet. So these are profound questions. And, and, and of course, we can go on and on to discussing, you know, and, and we need that much money, you know, for, for a, a proper ecological transition for new energy metrics. We need these and that money for uh, resilient food systems. And we need a little bit of that here and there. But believe me, we do need to come to grips uh, to uh, 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 a whole retooling and overhaul of, of our, our, our economic systems, but also in the way we govern and we take decisions uh, over our global commons. Uh, it, some good news in, 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 in the midst of this chaos a little bit, but good news, a few days ago, 
uh, the Portuguese parliament passed a law where they, they recognize climate as, as a common heritage, okay. as a global public good. And, and this is a very good step, step forward. It's not good enough, but it's a good example of what it should be. We are co-responsible to ensure that um, we can deliver, take care of, and provide uh, our uh, global public goods. And, um, and of course, climate is a common heritage in the same way that uh, oceans and biodiversity. And, and perhaps, uh, Neda, just to close, I would like to pick up on something that Augusto mentioned is, that is so critical to this conversation, the issue of sovereignty and state sovereignty. And, uh, and I really think we, we need to, to reframe the idea of national sovereignty. My country first. Uh, you know, uh, national interest. After decades of the negotiations, I can tell you, but national interest, uh, our sovereignty, our sovereign right to decide, it so happens that the best way to exercise your sovereignty and to address your national interest is by cooperating and uh, by being serious about agreeing uh, into a, a a global multi-stakeholder uh, shared responsibility uh, over our commons. That's the best way to guarantee that your people in your country are going to, uh, you know, uh, are to survive, and that your youth, and uh, that's the best way of of uh, of uh, exercising national sovereignty. Uh, so thank you, and back to you, Neda. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, uh, Augusta, do you want to also comment on the, this idea of, of um, this? I mean, you, you've written a, a book about global governance and um, maybe you want to, oh, um, maybe um, if we, I think we're being joined by Yute. Um, is that right? Have I lost Yute again? So, um, Augusto, and until we we are joined by you, Tim, maybe you can you can um, quickly yes. share with us your. Yes, indeed. Um, um, I think we are sorry. <laughs> sorry to, I'm to happy interrupt to, you. I'm happy to defer and let's give the floor to to you. I think um, yes, she's I think connecting, she's connecting. Um, uh, please go ahead until we have you. I don't know if you is uh, able to join us. Um, yet she's connected so okay okay you know, as go. the moderator feel free to interrupt me as uh you know whenever you feel you feel is the, is, is the time i i just wanted to agree completely and wholeheartedly with the point made by by maria fernanda about national sovereignty i think that i think that it's a, it's an, an anachronism you know to talk about the national interest um the way we do today on the positive side I think that the members of the European Union have, have already recognized that there is a strength in creating uh, supranational institutions which, are, uh, which can then address issues that, that go beyond national borders. Uh, absolutely, the, the, the wave of the future is through international cooperation. Part of the problems that we have today is that we're not developing the mechanisms and the instrumentality to, to facilitate international cooperation in these areas. I will pause here because I see that yes. your, your guest has arrived. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We have with us now uh, Jutta Gutland. I hope I've pronounced your name right. She is member of the European Parliament. She is a Swedish uh, politician and she's also the special rapporteur, parliament rapporteur for EU climate law. And she was the, um, the drive behind the new EU climate law. Perhaps you can share with us, um, you know, the the aspects of making um, uh, the commitment to net carbon zero a legal obligation legislated by law. Uh, you, you need to. Yes. Thank you, very Thank you very much, and I hope the sound is okay. I'm Perfect. at the moment. At the moment, I'm a participant in the European Parliament delegation to COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and um, of course, I relate the discussion that you are having uh, to the ongoing discussion here and also in 
in the, the meeting room that I just left. And I'm very sorry that I, I was a little bit late. The whole day we were late. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. Uh, but I'm very honored to participate in this uh, discussion. Uh, I will definitely focus on the climate law. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, I believe that the climate law is the flagship of the whole Green Deal and that the European Union has uh, accomplished by the focus on the European Green Deal a new uh, opportunity for leadership also here uh, in Glasgow. Okay. And uh, I, I really believe since I was the member in the European Parliament since 2014, and I have had the pleasure to, to participate in the debates since then, uh, that we have a new chapter in the European Union since 2019. Because back then, when I was participating in the, the dialogues with the other EU institutions, and also I was the, the shadow uh, for uh, the ETS reform back then, um, I often felt that the climate and environmental questions were often very low down in the agenda. And uh, in the plenary discussions in the European Parliament, we were often the one who stayed up in the evening and the night uh, because it was not uh, very high on the agenda. Uh, and that has literally changed, or I should say completely changed. Uh, so today we are often uh, the one who starts the debates uh, and the climate and the Green Deal and the, the uh, whole uh, growth strategy that uh, the Green Deal is, has uh, uh, completely changed the atmosphere. And today we take the debates first and uh, everyone is talking about it and the leadership of the European Union is, uh, is a historic change. So I start there by being a bit uh, arrogant, uh, but uh, this is due to many people and the work of many people. Uh, the reason why the European Union now is taking that leadership and is uh, changing uh, the, the, the growth strategy. Um, but all that said, um, I would like to say a few words on the climate law and then a bit on the challenge that we have ahead of us. But I continue now with the climate law. That was indeed uh, the flagship of the European Green Deal and um, uh, both uh, that the European Union choose to say that we will at least at the latest at 2050 be climate neutral and we will be the first region in the world that will take that, uh, have that goal. Um, it was something that could unite uh, everyone uh, to have a, a, a goal uh, that we would uh, have a trajectory uh, towards. Uh, and then via the climate law, we also uh, worked a lot on the different steps towards that uh, goal. And we accomplished to have higher targets for 2030. So from the 40%, we went to the at least 55%, which is uh, truly um, an ambition uh, rise. Uh, I would though like to say that from the European Parliament side, we would have wished for 60%. I could even say at least there, uh, but uh, I also see that it was a big effort from uh, many member states to come to where we were. And I'm also very happy that we, uh, we also focused on reduction. So uh, we have a, a target for how much could be the coal sink and how much must be reduction. I believe that's really important to make sure that everyone contributes and make sure that we also follow the Paris Agreement. I'm also very happy that uh, the conclusion and the climate law also delivered on a couple of other elements as the green has gas budget, who I truly believe can be a tool to uh, help us during the travel that we have ahead of us. And also to have, um, uh, as we accomplish, to have a council with experts who will evaluate the, the, how, we, how we succeed in fulfilling the Paris Agreement, but also our own targets. 
And many of these things will help the European Union to be the leader in the global conversation taking place, not only this week, but also in the future. All that said, um, now I've been so extremely positive and uh, very much um, uh, not very nice because I've been uh, too arrogant that uh, everything is fine. I would like to conclude by the challenges and then it will be less arrogant because uh, I also believe that uh, we are now in a moment where we see at this COP that the world is not delivering uh, what's needed uh, until 2030. And we have a responsibility absolutely as the European Union to make sure that these last three days here at the COP is improving the situation substantially. Uh, we just spoke to the executive director, um, Inja Andersen from UNEP, and listening to her and seeing how the discussion today is about the NDCs accomplishing 1.8 or maybe uh, maybe a bit more, or maybe even all two or uh, more. It's a mess, actually. <laughs> and it is not, we have not achieved at this COP 1.8. So let's be clear about that. Uh, we are absolutely not there. What has happened is Turkey has uh, uh, said that they are uh, willing to, to contribute and be part and have the NDC improved uh, by, by having the NDCs. And we also seen that India has uh, also developed, uh, showed the uh, willingness to do more. Uh, but we still have so much more to do if we should really truly believe that we have accomplished something that is well beyond two degrees and close to 1.5. So I really believe we need these three days as the European Union to, to call on um, the big polluters to do much more on their NDCs and also contribute much more to the climate financing mm. uh, to make the trust we need also for the developing countries to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask you, um, how do you feel the conversation is going to go? I mean. There's a lot of, uh, we heard so much from the small islands and we saw so many moving stories from them and how that two degrees is a death sentence, One, 1. 1.5 degrees is an absolute necessity. And the impact of climate uh, is obviously a cascading impact. It's not just going to, they're on the front lines, but it's gonna impact us all. Do you think anything is going to come from these last three days or is it just going to be business as usual? I think we need to believe in these three days. Um, we don't have the time to, to lose uh, time as many have rightly pointed out, but it's also actually about the fact that um, we, have, we have an opportunity now that we will not see in a couple of years. We have a United States who is willing to do more and they are really committed to be the leaders. They are saying, it's repeatedly saying it. So we could take the dance with them as the European Union and tell them that if you really mean it, you must do more than to have climate neutrality as your goal. And you must also do more than to have your climate package with the investments you need to deliver on the NDCs. And you also need to do more on climate financing. Um, and we need to talk to China in the same spirit or maybe with a little bit more um, uh, focus on, uh, on, on the big challenges that is there. And then I'm thinking about the coal plants. Uh, we cannot go on having uh, new coal plants every week. Uh, we, it needs to stop. And if, if they are truly willing to have their trajectory to climate neutrality, as they are pointing out, then we need to see their NDCs also. What are they actually accomplishing until 2030? Uh, so that is also something where I think that the European Union via the, the EU Commission can accomplish something by the, their own leadership, but also by having bilateral talks with China who could 
China could really be the key to, to a lot. Tomorrow we will, uh, in the European Union, meet Russia. Uh, so I will be able to say more tomorrow. Uh, but of course, they also have an important role. Um, I also believe that we need uh, to have climate financing um, uh, more. We need more trust in this discussion. And for the trust, the, the countries who should contribute need to show that they are willing not only to have pledges, but they are willing to do it. Uh, without that, I don't think the developing countries will feel the trust. So it's really important that uh, the, uh, the countries who pollute the most realize that you cannot talk as if this is some kind of aid. This is not aid, it's a responsibility because we have polluted the world and contributed in the history to the situation we are in. So this is not aid, it's about doing what's necessary uh, to help out the damage we created ourselves. And I think G20 is, uh, G20, they need to understand that we together are contributing to 80% of the pollution. So uh, and the, the emissions. So there is a great responsibility here. And as soon as the sooner we realize that, the better. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll, you know, if, if Maria or Augusta would like to add on, on this last point. Um, well, come to you tomorrow. Well, perhaps very quickly, um, I, I think that um, there are, you know, good news from the European Union, very happy uh, to see. I haven't studied in detail the climate law, but I think it's good news uh, for the world. I was just mentioning, uh, you know, the, the breakthrough in, a, in a, a Portuguese national legislation acknowledging that climate is a common heritage in, in a global public good and that we all have responsibility. But I cannot agree more that in order to, to have a, an, a, an outcome that at least would be, you know, the minimum common denominator after, after uh, COP26 is a matter of trust. Uh, uh, trust among parties. Uh, it's very much dependent on how serious countries are on, on making sure that the, the uh, climate finance package is delivered, but it, it is not only a matter of resources, it is a matter of technology transfer and capacity building as well, and it is a matter of a greater ambition uh, from um, the, the most important uh, emitters of course. So there are many preconditions uh, to, to have a successful uh, outcome of the COP. As I understand, the Prime Minister of the UK is, uh, is uh, coming back to Glasgow or is there today. In, in Glasgow today. So uh, this is a, a good sign, but in, in my years and years of experience in climate negotiations, when the Prime Minister of the President uh, have to go back uh, to the COP site, uh, you know, it means that there is really a need to for a boost, and I, I really hope that the boost uh, gives uh, fruit, and uh, that there are uh, that the outcome uh, is uh, at the level of expectations of public opinion right now, because uh, a climate is a, not a, a one more thing; it, it is a defining factor for the future of humanity. So, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Agita Guteland, for, for um, your input and your analysis. Extremely useful. Thank you. Um, Augusto, maybe would you like to have some final words on this before we close? Um, first of all, I wanted to congratulate uh, Ms. Guteland for the leadership role that the European Union is taking uh, on, on climate issues. Um, I think it's very encouraging. I think it's a model for the rest of the world. I think it is something that they must leverage to persuade others, um, some of the other players, especially within the G20, you know, to follow in its footsteps and to implement ambitious, ambitious measures. Unfortunately, the European Union is not in and of itself, you know, going to be able to solve the, the problem of climate change for us, you know. It, it has to bring other, other partners. China is absolutely vital. So is the United States and, and many of the other large emitters um, that are part of the G, G20. 
Um, I just wanted to mention quickly in passing an initiative that was announced in COP26 last week of two island states, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu, I think it was. Um, basically, their prime ministers gave a press conference, which was reported in the New York Times and in other, in other news outlets, essentially saying that they were going to take up the issue of climate change through the international legal system. Um, you know, they are countries under threat as a result of the actions of other countries. Um, for them, it's an existential threat. If China continues to build, uh, um, you know, carbon, carbon plants uh, and does not commit even, which it, does, it has not done so far to the 1.5 degree centigrade uh, threshold, then um, these countries are under threat. And therefore there is an issue of legality here that needs to be explored, perhaps through the International Court of Justice. And I welcome these kinds of initiatives. I think that we need to be innovative. We need to be creative. We need to act on multiple fronts. Um, just as we need to explore uh, the many, many ways in which we could raise the finance to, to, to make this transition to a renewable economy possible, I think that we should also explore legal options. And I welcome this initiative on the part of these two small island states to turn this into an issue of international law uh, that may require taking it to, you know, to uh, some place like the International Court of Justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have come to uh, the end of our time, unfortunately, and we thank you. Uh, we have gained so much from our distinguished panelists. I am really grateful and it's been a pleasure, privilege to hear your thoughts and your wisdom and your insights on this very complicated topic. Um, uh, you know, we have many aspects to it. Uh, it's not just so simple and not so easy, but I'm also very grateful to our participants who joined us um, on this and um, we have to change course. It's obvious that we have to change course. Climate uh, crisis is a defining uh, crisis of our time. And um, if we want for humanity to survive, then we need to change course. And I would like to end with um, a quote by Sir David Attenborough, who um, said at the opening speech that if working apart, we are a force so powerful enough to destabilize our planet, then surely working together, we are powerful enough to save it. And hopefully on that note, with the European Union, with, uh, with the Latin America, with, with um, the world, you know, from Europe, everywhere, um, we can work together and, and find a solution to this um, defining moment in our time. Thank you so much. It has been a, a truly a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.